Here's an MRI showing these little white blubs. I know that's kind of hard to see. Can you see now? Um, those are also just these microaneurysms. It's just using a different imaging modality. And then they, um, here actually, um, they were able to look at smaller vessels in the fat and actually show that they leaked. So we know that at some point, and I'm not sure where it is, is it when you're in stage two? Is it when you're in actually stage three? Or, or do you actually develop lymphedema before they start leaking? Or does your fat continue to take up all that fluid. I don't think we really know that. We haven't phenotyped women that well. <coughs> and I, I was looking back through the literature and I found this paper by 1910. I was actually looking at corsets. Um, and the reason I was looking at corsets is because if you look at some of the other older pictures of women who are wearing corsets, do they have any fat under the corset? No, they don't. The fat has been redistributed. So I thought, well, maybe we should just put women with lipidema in a vice. <laughs> Maybe that would solve the problem. But um, well, as I was reading through this paper, um, Dickinson called this um, an over-feminine figure. So I said, oh, maybe uh, women with lipidema have over-feminine figures. Does that mean they're more feminine than they should be? <laughs> or is a woman with lipidema the ultimate female? <laughs> So what about recent published data on lipidema? So when you do research, you need validated questionnaires. And so um, just this year, um, they validated uh, the patient benefit index questionnaire. So uh, we could look at uh, women who have lipidema or people who have lymphedema. And it is a direct measurement of quality of life with the patients rating both importance and achievement of treatment goals. So this would be great if you wanted to follow um, to see whether pneumatic pump therapy worked for women with lip or manual lymph drainage because there's no data that, you know, in a large study of whether manual lymph drainage works or compression garments. So this would be wonderful if we do a research study to take a look at this particular questionnaire. And it's great that they included lip, isn't that? Isn't that great? I'm very excited about that. Um, there's also a way we can measure uh, extracellular tissue water. Uh, and this is by this tissue dielectric constant. Um, they're actually selling one um, at the National Lymphedema Network, and I'm probably going to get one. And However, when they looked at women with untreated lymphedema, compared them to women with treated lymphedema or women with lipidema or controls, they found that there was um, a significant increase in extracellular fluid in the untreated lymphedema, but not in any of the other groups. So treated lymphedema looked like lymphedema, which looked like controls, looked like normal women. So what benefit is this, right? The problem is um, the way they measured it. You, you can probably not see that here, but they laid the arm down like this and they covered it so that the doctor couldn't see the phenotype of the arm, which was really great. I thought that was... Um, a good way to, to, to do this study so that they weren't biased. But this is, they're only looking at the arm. So where, where is most of the lippy problem? It's the legs. So what if I took that uh, dielectric constant and I looked here on a really heavy paniculus or on your boob or on your leg, thigh or on your lower leg. So I think that still might be worth doing and I think I'm probably still gonna get it because maybe if I could measure it on a woman I could say, you have much more fluid here and here. We could help direct the, the physical therapist, and we can also validate that you are more like lymphedema and get a better chance of getting things covered. So that's kind of where my mind's going right now. And then um, Polly Armour gave me this paper, and um, it's by Solnoki. Did I say that right? Solnoki? Did, did I say that right? Or it's not here. Um, and he is looking at the pathophysiologic dilemmas of lipidema. And what that means is he just went through in this whole paper and, and said, what's lipidema? It could be this, it could be that, it could be this, it could be that. And he just, if you ever wanted to figure out or have a conversation with someone really knowledgeable about what lipidema could be, you should read this paper. So what about research on lipidema? So um, Dr. Domstra's group actually completed a study. I don't know if the data's out yet, but they were looking at differences in muscle strength between women with lipidema and women with obesity, and I think this is right up Dr. Stutz's aisle. 
um, and whether there's a difference in physical fitness between women with lipidema and women with obesity. So I think um, when that data comes out, it'll be kind of cool. And then I actually got, have an IRB approved protocol to look at the standard of care for lipidema. Uh, it's a questionnaire that I'm gonna send out to therapists, physicians all over the world. And we're gonna collect the data and it will be presented at a symposium at the next NLM meeting a year from now. So I, I could use some help with that. So if you're interested in helping um, establish at least our initial, you know, first time publication for standard of care for lipidema, um, let me know, I can use some volunteers. So Durkham's disease. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Durkham's original patient. She was a woman from Ireland. You can see she has these, this big hanging fold of fat on the upper arm. What does that look like? It's like lip, right? And the folds of fat on the back, that it looks pretty much like a stage three. And then here's another uh, picture of a, a woman who's got these big like pulmons on her arms. I know that's kind of hard to see, but she looks like FML. And they're, you know, this, they're all calling this Durkham's disease, hence the overlap between these fat disorders. I don't think we really know. In Durkham's disease, painful lipomas are the hallmark. They can appear anywhere on the body. Usually if someone comes to me, they don't know if they have lip or Durkham's. I usually focus on what, what developed first. Did you get a big lipoma on your chest that really hurt and then you had it taken off and all of a sudden all these other lipomas started appearing on your body? That sounds more like Durkham's disease to me. But in Durkham's disease, what I feel is lippy tissue everywhere. Everywhere. So does that mean that maybe there's a, a component to Durkham's disease um, along the lines of uh, an increased amount of inflammation that allows the lippy tissue to present itself everywhere instead of just areas where blood pools when you stand up could be. There may be some differences in genetics between these two. I don't know. We don't have the gene for either one. So sometimes I get confused and I sit there and stare at people. <laughs> Uh, and I don't know. And I think that's an okay thing. I think it's okay not to know. So sometimes I give people two diagnoses. So yes, you can be diagnosed with Durkham's disease and lipidema because a lot of times the Durkham's disease develops on the upper body first and then the lipidema appears on the lower legs. And if you read some of the historical publications, in families with Durkham's disease, the men get lipomas and the women get fat. And what do they have? They have you look at them and they have lip. They just have some lipomas with it. And if you have lipidema, you can develop lipomas, but that doesn't mean you have Durkham's disease. You just have more inflammation in your tissue causing those fat cells to congeal together in a lump. And you should be focusing on inflammation and reducing inflammation. And Linda Kahn would be very happy that I said that. Uh, and I mentioned that it was autosomal dominant, and we don't know the etiology, but Dr. Durkham proposed an abnormal hemangiolymph system. So both blood vessels and lymphatic vessels involved. Doesn't that sound like familiar multiple lipomatosis, right? You know, hence the overlap between these fat disorders. This is a picture of a woman with Durkham's disease. It says right down here, typical Durkham's disease. What do these legs look like? <laughs> so, we're looking at lipidema and Durkham's disease side by side. In lipidema, you get painful nodular fat. Um, it can be minimal pain, only on pressure, to unbearable and disabling, as Dr. Stutz so aptly pointed out. In Durkham's disease, you really have, you usually have high pain from the onset in the fat and in these lipomas. Uh, the lipomas can be on the, on the head, the chest, the trunk, the back, um, and the back is often affected initially. And in lipidema, you have the disproportion. You also have arms affected in a, in a high proportion, 80 to 90%. In Durkham's disease, you get a lot of muscle involvement. I have this review of systems, and I can just look at that section for muscle, and it's all checked positive. I go, hmm, maybe they have Durkham's disease. Um, there's also a deep and wide review of systems. People with Durkham's disease are pretty sick. I mean, really sick. Very, very disabled. Uh, you know, we talked about when lip appears. Um, I did a questionnaire and I found that the average age for appearance in Durkham's disease was 35. It can appear in children. It can appear as late as 80 years of age. We know there's lymphatic dysfunction in lipidema, but I propose that there was lymphatic dysfunction in Durkham's disease, and I've been sending patients with Durkham's disease or manual lymph drainage for years. But we really didn't have data showing that there was any kind of lymphatic dysfunction there. Until, so 
So this is a publication that just came out. Um, I collaborated with um, Eva Sevek Maraca and this guy, John Rasmussen, and then this is the rest of their team. And I went down to Houston. I got Durkham's disease patients to go down there. They injected them with indocyanin green at different parts of their bodies because we didn't know where to inject them. Do we just inject them on their legs like you would for lymphedema? Or how about we inject them on the upper body? Or, or maybe we should just do both. So um, we were just kind of trying to figure this out. And this is an example of what the lymphatics look like in a normal person and in a person with Durkheim's disease. So I'll walk you through it. Um, they've done injections and they cover it with tape. So the injections look kind of funny. Here, here's some tape here, here, here. And you can see these long lymphatics, nice and long, linear. Look at these go all the way up the leg very nicely. The deeper they go, the more schmutzy it appears. So this particular methodology really lets you see the lymphatics that are closer to the skin, but not um, really, really deep lymphatics. And you can see, you can already see the difference here, right? There's a lot of empty space here. So um, this is a, a very nice lymphatic here. It's extremely dilated and you know enlarged, and actually you can put your fingers on it and you can palpate it. And I think you saw in Dr. Stutz's ultrasound that you saw these sclerotic lymphatics and lipedema. That's what this is here too. So we have something similar in Durkheim's disease um, as we do in lipedema. And then you can see here um, on the lower leg that there's a very dilated uh, vessel here. That's not a deep one. Um, these are the deeper ones. This is not deep. This should look like this, but it doesn't. It's just, it's really large and it's probably um, getting ready to leak. So this is the uh, really first documentation. And there's others. There's movies that go along with this if you want to watch pumping. There's lots and lots of other pictures. But I think um, this is the first convincing data that yes, there is lymphatic dysfunction in Durkheim's disease. So Dr. Durkheim was right in 1888. So the NIH is currently uh, doing a phenotyping study. They're looking at people who have excess fat on their bodies. And they're super, super, super interested in Durkheim's disease. I don't know why they're not as interested in lipedema, but there's one researcher there who knows about Durkheim's disease, and so that's probably why they're focusing on that. Just pick one thing and, and, and go for it. So anyone with Durkheim's disease can apply to participate, and this is the contact information for uh, one of their technicians. So I'm really excited to see what they what, what happens. If you do go there, um, you'll get your metabolic rate checked. You'll, you'll live in a room for a little while, and they'll follow your metabolism as you eat and not eat. And then they'll do biopsies, they'll take your blood, um, they'll do your genetics, and you won't get the data. You won't get the data, you'll be contributing to science. <laughs> And you're all running out there now, right? You're all on the phone. Doctor, uh, yes. Is that the biopsy? Would that would they risk of causing more lipomas? Uh, so some people who have Durkheim's disease who get biopsies do develop additional lipomas because it does generate inflammation. So if you're very inflamed, it's probably not a great idea to get a biopsy. And I don't know if they'd let you participate without getting a biopsy. Uh, there, um, so Dr. Todd Malin in Scottsdale, Arizona, he is, he does liposuction, um, but he's really fallen in love with stem cells, and he has a protocol looking at people who have autoimmune disorders and what happens to them after they get a stem cell infusion, and what he does is he takes the whole water genesis to liposuction of the fat, removes the fat cells, and he puts them back in your vein. So the, the stem cells in the fat are quiescent. When they get removed, they become activated, they go onto your blood, and then they're gonna go anywhere where they're needed. They'll heal anything that needs to be healed. So if you fell and you sprained your wrist that morning and you went in for your stem cells, guess where they're gonna go? Not to your lippy fat, not to your Durkheim's fat, they're gonna go to your wrist. So probably not a good idea to go on that day. Um, he is um, taking any patient who has Durkheim's disease I am trying to send him like the absolute worst patients with Durkheim's disease that I have nothing else to offer because I think that you know those people really should go there since I have nothing else to offer them. Um, I've got other patients with Durkheim's disease who are like in, doing really, really well and they want to go there and I'm like, ooh, you know, I don't think it's going to cure you. But I think it would help you feel better enough to start really taking good care of yourself. 